Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to tonight's Bob Beatty Postgraduate Awards Night. It's the second night, a second uh, occasion of this uh, of this wonderful event organised by the KPA, for which many uh, for which many thanks. I think this is an opportunity that enables us all to come together um, to celebrate the academic best that our postgraduate students do, and you'll get a glimpse of that, uh, more than a glimpse, in just a moment when we do the um, three-minute thesis. But it's also uh, an opportunity to celebrate um, the collegiality um, and wonderful cooperative spirit, I think, that, uh, that, that pervades our postgraduate population in the way that it does all aspects of the university life. Um, for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm David Amigoni. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor um, for Research and Enterprise. Um, I work very closely with um, Jan Smith and the postgraduate uh, community and the KPA. Um, and it's my pleasure to start us off this evening before you have your dinner. Um, so you are going to have to involve yourself in a bit of listening and learning um, with the three minute thesis competition. Um, this is the Keel Three Minute Thesis Final. Um, and um, let's just think about what this is. Um, the Three Minute Thesis Background um, is an academic competition developed by the University of Queensland in Australia. Um, the first Three Minute Thesis competition was held in uh, the University of Queensland in 2008 with 160 candidates competing. In 2009 and 2010, the three-minute thesis competition was promoted to other Australian and New Zealand universities and enthusiasm for the concept grew. Due to its adoption in numerous universities, a multinational was, uh, event was developed and the inaugural Trans-Tasman three-minute thesis competition was held at the University of Queensland in 2010. Since 2011, the popularity of the competition has increased and three-minute co three thesis competitions are now held in over 600 universities um, across more than 65 countries worldwide. And um, in the UK last year, um, Keel was one of 58 universities taking part. So who's it for? Who's this for? It's for active PhD uh, and professional doctorate research candidates who've successfully passed their upgrade milestone by the date of their first presentation um, and are eligible to participate in three-minute thesis. Now, what's involved in this for anyone who hasn't seen it before? In three-minute thesis, participants are challenged to present their research using one slide only in three minutes, and their voice, of course. No slide transitions, animations, or movement of any description. No sound or video. No additional props, e.g. costumes, musical instruments, laboratory equipment are permitted. So if you see any of that, the person will be marched quickly off the stage. No poems, raps or songs, and go beyond three minute thesis as the title suggests and you will be disqualified. Okay, so why is three minute thesis such a great idea? Um, some testimony from one of last year's um, competitors. Being able clearly to clearly articulate my research and its impact has helped in scientific presentations via viva preparation and grant application. So there's a serious um, research and professionalisation dimension um, to this, as well as there being a lot of fun. And it enables you furthermore to bond with your family in ways that you may not have done hitherto. Finally, after four years, as Fraser reminded us, even my dad knows what my PhD involves. I'm afraid I come from a generation which wasn't trained in three-minute thesis, so my family remain utterly baffled by me. What are the judges um, looking for? Well, they're interested, and we have a, we have a, a table um, judging the competition tonight. They're interested in comprehension and content and engagement, and they'll be asking whether the presenter has reached their non-specialist audience um, and enabled them to grasp the background to the research questions and its significance. And they'll also be asking, have they conveyed their enthusiasm 
for the work and helped us to understand why it's important. And do they leave us wanting more? Bear all that in mind as you listen to our very brave um, presenters as they come forward this evening. Just before we do that, just a word about what comes next after um, tonight's uh, final. Well, the winner of the Kiel final will go forward to the Vitae National Competition, where the finalists from each institution will be judged in a virtual semi-final during July and August. Now, from here, six finalists will then be selected to perform live at the Vitae Research and Development International Conference during the gala dinner in Birmingham on the 17th of September 2018, where the six finalists will present to the Vitae Conference participants. So no pressure whatsoever. So back to the Kiel competition. Now, the competition has, uh, we're very grateful for this, been coordinated by ILAS, our vibrant institute um, for liberal arts and sciences, based here at Keel Hall. Um, uh, huge thanks to um, Jo Flynn for all the work that she's done on this. As you know, ILAS promotes interdisciplinary activity across the university, uh, among academics and students, and it has an important role to play in enhancing the cultural and academic experience for the Keele postgraduate community. Um, this year, across the university, there have been four rounds of three-minute thesis and at the ILAS postgraduate conference, Faculty of Natural Sciences Symposium, the ISTM Symposium, and the Humanities Symposium. And there were 23 entrants in total, which is absolutely um, great to see. So the winner, the winners from those heats are all here tonight to present. And in alphabetical order, they are Alison Aries, Angela Blanchard, Annabelle Machin, Sarah McKevitt, and Grant Mitchell. Now, I'll introduce you to each of these in the order in which they'll be presenting. And in fact, that's reverse uh, alphabetical order, so in reverse to the order I've just read out, accompanied by a slide for each. So first of all, um, it's my great pleasure um, to welcome um, Grant Mitchell. Grant is one of the winners from the ILAS competition. Um, Grant is a second year full-time PhD student in Spire and his supervisor is Dr Liz Carter. And his presentation title Dealing with the radical right, mainstream parties and competition strategies. So, Grant, if you could come forward, please. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. So, when you're faced with an opponent that's attempting to challenge your lead, what do you do? Do you face your opponent down, reassert your dominance? Do you become so confused to the point of doing nothing? Or do you smear your opponent and hope that that does the trick? These are decisions that are made by political parties every time that a new challenger enters the political fray. Now, throughout much of Western Europe, Established political parties have had to come to grips with the widespread upsurge of right-wing radical parties for whom traditional comprehensive policy platforms so common among the established political parties have been issued in favour of a more restricted set of political issues, particularly that of immigration and integration. Indeed, these issues have proved so potent that right-wing radical populists have staged effective electoral challenges throughout most of Western Europe, almost winning the presidency in Austria, supporting governments in the Netherlands, participating in government in Finland, and as no doubt many of you will be aware, winning the prime ministership in Italy, the first true populist government. The success of radical right parties has had a clear impact upon our politics, not only in terms of the issues we discuss and the problems that we address through policy, but the policy solutions that we in fact choose. And as the radical right becomes more successful, the influence that they have will grow. So the focus of my PhD then is twofold. 
Firstly, I want to ascertain exactly what strategies the mainstream has adopted against the radical right. In order to do this, I will gather data from the majority of countries in Western Europe over a 15-year time period. This should reveal the breadth and breadth of the strategies that have been employed. Secondly, I will subject these strategies to an analytical stage to work out which have been most successful. This stage will employ qualitative comparative analysis, which is a fairly novel analytical approach that combines qualitative and quantitative methods to ensure that one gets a strong overview of the concept, but without losing those little details that's so common among other statistical methods. By completing this research, I hope to discover the strategies that the mainstream adopts against the radical right. Not only would this fill a gap in the existing literature, but for all of the, us here, I'm sure, it provides us with a normative benefit. How do we protect our democratic liberal values against those that would seek to undermine and ultimately destroy them? Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Grant. OK, if I can introduce our next presenter, please. Our next presenter is Sarah McEvitt, uh, who is a full-time PhD student in the second year of her studies in the Institute of Primary Care and Health Sciences. Um, she's supervised by Dr Jonathan Quick, along with Dr Claire Jenks and Dr Emma Healy. Sarah is one of the winners from the ILAS Heat, um, and the winner also um, of the ILAS People's Prize. The title of her presentation is Physical Activity, PA, in People with, with Osteoarthritis and Comorbidity, a multi-method study. Please welcome Sarah McEvitt. Hubrick's is 77. He doesn't look a bit of it. Obviously, he's been doing something right all through his long life. In 2017, Hubrick's, my granddad, died, aged 87. He lived a great life, but he was far from the man in this photo in his final years. After this photo, he was diagnosed with a number of health conditions, such as osteoarthritis and diabetes, and seemed to have more prescriptions to treat these conditions than he did hot dinners. And trust me, Hugh liked his dinner. Hugh is a great illustration of our ever-increasing ageing population. That is, enduring the, impa the impact of having multiple chronic conditions that will almost certainly impact on your quality of life. Osteoarthritis is one of the most common musculoskeletal conditions in older adults. It's characterised by joint pain accompanied with functional limitation and a reduced quality of life. This makes osteoarthritis a leading cause of disability estimated to impact at least 130 million people worldwide by 2050. Also, up to 85% of people with osteoarthritis will report comorbidity. Now, comorbidity is any other health condition existing alongside the primary condition. Currently, there's no cure for osteoarthritis. Therefore, current treatment aims to improve the lives of those living with it. Clinical guidelines recommend physical activity treatment. Strengthening and aerobic exercise have been proven to reduce pain and improve physical function by up to 40%. However, this treatment is underprescribed and barriers make it underused. My PhD is a multi-method project comprised of three phases. My PhD aims to better understand the impact of comorbidity on those with osteoarthritis to contribute to new comorbidity adapted treatment and thus improve health outcomes. To date, the majority of research has been focused on osteoarthritis without taking account of comorbidity. And it's not known how osteoarthritis and comorbidity interact to affect people's physical activity behaviours. So, to answer these questions, first I synthesised the existing knowledge which revealed just how little research there was about the effectiveness of physical activity on people with osteoarthritis and comorbidity. I then explored relationships between physical activity behaviour and sedentary time amongst those with osteoarthritis and various comorbidities. 
And finally, in order to inform future treatments, it's essential also to explore the people's attitudes and beliefs of physical activity. This phase of the research requires field work directly with the people experiencing the problem in order to contribute to new adapted treatments. Hopefully, with enhanced and tailored recommendations to treat the real patient, we will see more people and people we know living longer, looking more like the man in this photo than the man that I grew accustomed to visiting in his final years. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. Okay, our next presenter is Dr. Annabelle Machin, um, who is also from the Institute for Primary Care and Health Sciences. She's currently in the second year of her PhD, and she's doing the work part-time, and she also works as a GP. Her supervisors are Professor Carolyn Chu Graham and Dr. Samantha Hyder. Um, her presentation title is Anxiety and Depression in Patients with Inflammatory Arthritis. Yep. One in every four people in this room will suffer from a mental health problem, but how many of you will suffer in silence? I'd like to share with you the story of a silent sufferer, someone I've met whilst working as a GP, an elderly lady named Margaret. Margaret has rheumatoid arthritis, the commonest inflammatory arthritis that affects one in every hundred people. And this causes her joints to become swollen, stiff and painful. And Margaret has seen several of my colleagues regarding her joint pains, but noticing she appeared down, I decided to inquire about her mood. And after listening to her concerns, she asked permission to hug me. I'd been the first to ask how she was feeling, and having that short opportunity just to share her distress had provided her immense relief. Mood, mood problems are extremely common in rheumatoid arthritis. One in five have anxiety, and more than one in three, depression. But these often aren't recognised or treated, and can lead to reduced length and quality of life. So therefore, I've interviewed people with rheumatoid arthritis and mood problems to determine the best approach to identifying their anxiety and depression. And overall, patients felt their doctor could often be dismissive or prioritise physical above mental health problems. But when given the opportunity to see a nurse who had time to listen, they felt more able to open up about their mood. I shared these findings with a group of patient volunteers and they were really keen for people with rheumatoid arthritis to be offered a regular review of a nurse where they could be asked about their mood. But they asked, why can't this review be offered to people with other types of arthritis? Couldn't they also be suffering in silence? And this led me to reflect, past research in this area has focused on depression but not anxiety in people with rheumatoid arthritis, but not other types of inflammatory arthritis. Therefore, I'm reviewing how anxiety impacts on people with rheumatoid arthritis. And I'm also going to determine how common mood problems are in different types of inflammatory arthritis. Then finally, I'm also helping to develop and evaluate a new clinic for people with inflammatory arthritis. They'll be invited to see a nurse at their local GP surgery, and there they'll be asked questions to identify health problems linked to their arthritis, including, crucially, anxiety and depression. Working as a GP, I've already been able to observe the positive impact of treating mental health problems in inflammatory arthritis by following the progress of Margaret. After a course of talking therapy, both her mood and joint pains have significantly improved. As a GP, you get the opportunity to help individuals like Margaret, but becoming a researcher has opened the potential for me to help so many more people who could also be suffering in silence. Let's hope their voices are finally heard. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Annabelle. Okay, uh, our next presenter uh, is Angela Blanchard uh, in the School of Psychology. She's uh, in the continuing, continuation phase of her uh, PhD work, that's to say in the final stages of writing up. 
Um, Angela started part-time in January 2014, but changed to full-time in January 2016. Angela's supervisors are Dr. Maggie Robinson and Dr. Kirsty Buds. And um, her presentation title is Through Fog, an Autoethnography of Childhood Emotional Neglect. So, Angela, if you'd like to come and join us. Something is wrong, but like the words on the screen, we can't see clearly what it is. We think we're okay, but the fog has crept up on us. We're lost and alone, and no one can help. This is childhood emotional neglect. Autoethnography blends autobiography, my own story, with ethnography, the story of a group of people. Unstructured interviews capture nuanced stories of emotional neglect, and I use my subjective experience to examine those stories in their social, cultural, and historical context. Blurring boundaries between research and creative writing, I set out to elicit a visceral response. Don't just hear this story, really feel it. Any child maltreatment has lasting consequences throughout childhood, adolescence, and adult life. Emotional neglect in particular is linked to adult depression and anxiety. This is probably a causal link, but the direction of the link remains unclear. In other words, was it them or was it me? Of all forms of child maltreatment, emotional neglect may be the most prevalent, yet it remains hidden, less clearly defined, foggy. We can see it's there, but it's hard to get hold of it and say these are its constituent parts. Less widely researched than other forms of child maltreatment, emotional neglect has been neglected. Thematic analysis of the data revealed common themes, feeling unloved, unwanted, unseen, unheard, a sense of disconnection, aloneness, a lack of joy. Taught in childhood that our feelings don't matter, it's hard in adulthood to recognize and attend to them. Blamed and criticized for childhood hurts and upsets, what's wrong with you becomes, it must be me. Taught not to have needs, not to make a fuss, not to inconvenience anyone, it's hard to ask for help or even recognize we need it. We're left confused, alone. If our own parents don't want us, don't love us, can't enjoy us, won't listen to our story, who will? Participants tell the social and cultural context of their childhoods. Hospital practices and child-rearing fashions which involved routine separation of mothers and babies. Religious or moral beliefs that stopped our parents expressing the love and approval that we needed. Pressures of work and home life or their own unmet childhood needs that left them unable to love, cherish and enjoy us. Childhood emotional neglect is widespread and appears to cause far-reaching harm, yet it still lacks clear definition and it remains poorly understood. It's a story that needs to be told. It's time to come out of the fog. Okay, our next presenter is Alison Aries from Shah, that's the School of Health and Rehabilitation. Um, and Alison is also linked to ISTM, that's the Institute of Science and Technology in Medicine. She's now in her third year of study and has recently changed from full-time to part-time, having completed her NIHR doctoral fellowship at the end of March 2018. Now, Alison was the winner of the ISTM three-minute thesis heat. Um, she's supervised by Dr. Sue Hunter, and her presentation title... These feet were made for walking. Please welcome Alison Aries. Our feet were made for walking. Can you imagine what it would be like if you suddenly couldn't move one side of your body and your foot was no longer made for walking? That's exactly what happened to Paul, a stroke survivor 
who suddenly lost the use of his dominant right side and was unable to walk. A stroke is usually caused by a blood clot in the brain. It's a bit like having a heart attack, but a brain attack. And every two seconds, somebody in the world has a stroke. That's 90 people by the end of this presentation. A stroke can cause problems with movement, but it can also cause a loss of feeling. And if you can't feel the floor beneath your feet, it's very difficult to balance and walk. My name is Alison Aries. I'm a physiotherapist, and I've just completed a funded doctoral fellowship looking at the feasibility of delivering treatment to increase movement and feeling in the foot after stroke to improve balance and walking. Developing evidence for therapy is important so that we can deliver the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. This image, drawn by Paul with his left hand, shows the principles behind my work. By increasing the sensory information coming back to the brain, it's possible to influence movement and improve balance and function. I worked with 12 experienced therapists to gain consensus, developing three standardised interventions. Firstly, hands-on therapy for the foot, involving massage and mobilisation of joints and soft tissues, stimulating the foot by touch, stretch and compression. Secondly, wearing a textured insole in the shoe. And lastly, walking training based on specific components of walking or task-specific walking training. I then looked at the feasibility of delivering these treatments in a clinical trial, recruiting 34 stroke survivors who were all given 20 sessions of task-specific walking training for half an hour, preceded either by the hands-on therapy or wearing a textured insole as much as they were able to. Outcome measures were undertaken before treatment, after 20 sessions and one month later. And participants recorded how their foot felt in a daily diary and attended a focus group discussion about how comfortable and acceptable the treatments were and whether the research should be taken forwards to a larger randomised controlled trial. Some of the quotations in the focus group are very powerful and I'll share two with you. One man in the hands-on group said, it was like knowing I've got two legs instead of one. And a lady in the insole group said, when I wore the insoles, I could feel my feet moving. I could use my brain to tell my foot to move a bit. And that only happened with wearing the insole. I think that says it all. If we can help stroke survivors to feel their feet again, we can help them to walk again, which is so important for quality of life. In the words of Abraham Lincoln, it's not the years in your life that count, it's the life in your years. We have to find a way of improving quality of life for people after stroke. And this is just a start. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Angela uh, Allison for that uh, for that for that presentation. There is just one final um, point. Uh, we have one finalist who unfortunately cannot be with us tonight, but we want to share with you what she would have um, uh, presented to us if she had been available um, to uh, attend. That finalist is Cara Holloway, um, who can't be here due to prior commitments. Um, Cara was the winner of the Faculty of Natural Sciences Symposium, um, a three-minute thesis heat with a presentation um, t uh, entitled a video-based student alcohol intervention app. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, it's my great pleasure as director of the Institute for Liberal Arts and Sciences, which uh, has hosted this evening's event. And it really is a privilege to work, I repeat the words that have been said earlier about the, the KPA and to work with you, Ian, and I know the, the president going, uh, going forward for a very close association uh, with the Institute for Liberal Arts and Sciences. And it's one that, uh, that uh, we're very proud of and we're also very grateful for the support you've given, you've given us. It was a very difficult job this evening. Um, I was given the, the, the role of chairing um, a very disciplined but very thoughtful panel. And I, when I went out, um, I thought I sent them out for five minutes and then went to check on them after 10 and they were still uh, deliberating away. So we do have some, uh, some, uh, some results for you now. I would say just before that, uh, that I've had the privilege of attending many of the other rounds that have led up to this. And I've been really 
bowled over by the standard um, of the presentations, um, showing the diversity and the range that we can, that, that our students um, have, um, uh, have engaged with, with, with their studies here at Kiel. It's, it's really a real privilege to see and also to meet and talk to some of those students afterwards. And I know one thing that students would like to say as well, um, and that's a word of thanks uh, to that many of them, not just individuals, but teams behind their work here, and that is the staff, um, uh, the supervisors, the mentors, and the staff that support them um, in their work uh, here at Kiel. It really is a team effort, and certainly, as you engage in the academic journey, you realise that collaboration, um, both with your peers and your juniors and your contemporaries, is a really, really important part of the academic journey. And I think the products of, of real high quality and high class we've seen this evening as a test to the ability of Kiel to provide just that such environment uh, for our students. But really to the, the real stars of the show this evening. So our first, uh, we, I've just got a few comments just that our, our judges would like to highlight from, from each of the contestants. Uh, Grant, where's Grant? Grant, the uh, judges felt that your... Um, Delivery was clear, it was really confident. Um, there was strong engagement from the start and, and a great outline of your methods and incredibly uh, well, well delivered. Uh, Sarah, Sarah, you were emotive and engaging uh, from the start, had a very personal touch to your delivery, excellent clarity, uh, a vibrancy to your, to your uh, performance um, and a note, double underlined here with two exclamation marks, absolutely perfect timing. I think you finished bang on the bang on bang on the buzzer, uh, Annabel. Hi, Annabel. Uh, the judges felt you had a wonderful use and style of prose, so maybe you've got a career elsewhere, as uh, beyond uh, beyond uh, your, your PhD. Um, you had a story which pulled the listeners in, really drew the listeners in. Um, you were able to outline um, your research in a really uh, clear and meaningful way, Angela. It's Angela. Angela. Um, the judges felt that uh, your work was incredibly descriptive, very powerful, um, a great use of uh, imagery um, and full um, of impact in, in, in all places. And then finally, see, finally, Alison. Alison, you had a very strong uh, verbal and physical emphasis in, your, in the delivery of, of your, of your three-minute thesis, a really clear narrative that was clearly uh, appreciated um, uh, by, by, by the judges. So uh, it was a very difficult decision. Uh, uh, unlike many of these other popular television contests, we don't now have the people's vote, I'm afraid. Maybe in future years we can have those buzzers and we can see how you would like to disagree with the judging panel. But we have to come to a very, very, very difficult decision. It was really, really close and uh, we could have spent a lot longer uh, arguing about it this evening. But the, uh, the decision uh, uh, from the judges this evening uh, was down to what was uh, a very powerful and for me a very engaging um, uh, uh, narrative that really drew me into the study and also the importance of the work right from the very start through to the beginning, uh, th from the beginning to the end. So the, uh, the winner of the three minute thesis competition at Kiel this year is Angela Blanchard.